Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Palestine in Session. Today's topic will be defunding UNRWA, Gaza's remaining lifeline. And I want to start off by just providing a brief historical trajectory of UNRWA, what it means and its purpose and how we got to this point today with its uh, potential defunding. So basically, uh, Palestinian refugees are the world's largest refugee population. And they are defined as persons whose normal place of residence was Palestine and who lost their homes and means of livelihood and are unable to return. The ongoing Palestinian Nakba, which we are living in right now, or catastrophe, has now spanned 75 years. The result of which now we have approximately 8 million Palestinian refugees and internally displaced persons dispersed throughout the world. Palestinian refugees continue to face an uphill battle in securing their rights. Reparations for Palestinian refugees would provide the full scope of rights, and that would include the right of return, which encompasses four remedies, repatriation, compensation, restitution, and satisfaction. However, there is a gap in the international mechanism for protecting refugees. This gap flows from a flawed and deficient system of refugee protection, which is unique to Palestinians. Now, why do I say unique? Because the Palestinian refugees do not benefit from the general framework for international protection. This framework is grounded in the Refugee Convention and the statute of the Office of the High Commissioner for, for Refugees. This regime seeks to secure the rights of refugees and provide durable solutions for their plight. But there's another framework, a framework that applies exclusively to Palestinians. This protection framework for Palestinian refugees flows from two main agencies, the United Nations Conciliation Commission for Palestine, which is um, UNCCP, and the United Nations Refugee Relief Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, which is UNRWA. Now, the UNCCP was established as the protective mechanism, while UNRWA was established as the assistance mechanism. This special regime was designed exclusively for the Palestinians and was intended to ensure that the Palestinian issue would not be submerged and relegated to a position of minor importance. So in actuality, this special regime was intended to provide a higher degree of protection than the normal regime that applies to refugees generally. However, in practice, this framework provides a manifestly inferior system of protection than that later established under the Refugee Convention and the statute of the UNHCR, which governs all other refugees. Now, the UNCCP, just back to that for a moment, was created by UN General Assembly Resolution 194, which was in part to facilitate the repatriation, resettlement, and economic and social rehabilitation of the refugees and the payment of compensation. One of the main goals of the UNCCP was to search for durable solutions for the refugees' plight, the main element being repatriation or return. It was ineffective while it existed and eventually became defunct. The UNCCP does publish an annual one-page report stating, quote, it has nothing new to report, end quote. It's essentially a defunct system. Palestinian refugees, are only left with UNRWA, United Nations Relief Works Agency, which was meant to provide short-term assistance. Now, why short-term? Because the international community rightly understood that refugee status necessarily implies a temporary timetable. Soon enough, these refugees would return to their homes and would be made whole. But after 75 years of exile, aided and abetted with our tax dollars, Palestinians are still denied their right to return, their right to compensation and restitution. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that all durable solutions are driven by the universal principle of refugee choice. That means the refugees decide, not Israel. With UNRWA as the main agency for Palestinian refugees, and because of its lack of an explicit protection mandate, specifically the element of pursuing and securing durable solutions, Palestinian refugees are deprived of the full scope of protection to which they are entitled. 
UNRWA was established under the General Assembly Resolution 302 to complement the work of the UNCCP to provide assistance as, quote, direct relief and works programs to Palestine refugees. I want to just spend a quick few seconds on that term, Palestine refugees. UNRWA has a geographic mandate. It's not related to specific people, but re related to geography. That's why it refers to Palestine refugees as opposed to Palestinian refugees. So the main scope, geographically speaking, are the occupied Palestinian territories, which includes the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Gaza, Jordan, uh, Jordan, and uh, Syria. And it, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that UNRWA now provides services through these through uh, essential programs such as education, health, relief and social services, microfinance, and emergency assistance. It further provides infrastructure and other improvements with refugee camps, and to a much lesser extent, a small degree of protection, but does not seek durable solutions, mainly repatriation. It's important to point out that UNRWA provides assistance to only approximately six or so million Palestinian refugees, and that includes mainly those that are registered refugees and internally displaced persons, and does not encompass the entire Palestinian refugee community. So UNRWA operates in these five areas, as I as I as I mentioned, um, the West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. So not only is UNRWA an inferior system pre-October 7th levels, it also does not encompass the entire refugee community. So the primary responsibility for ensuring the Palestinian refugees and realizing their rights guaranteed under international law rests primarily with the entity that caused it, and that is Israel. So now we're at a critical juncture. A genocide is ongoing in Gaza, claiming the lives of over 30,000 Palestinians, almost 31,000 Palestinians, and over 70,000 Palestinians wounded. 70% of the civilian infrastructure destroyed. Only 14 of the 36 hospitals are partially functional. The rest are completely non-functional. Over half the population is displaced, homeless, and the population is on the brink of famine. Now at this time more than ever before, humanitarian aid in Gaza and refugee support is of absolute significance, especially since over 70% of the population in Gaza are refugees. Now under these circumstances, the US has decided to suspend funding to Gaza's final lifeline, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, UNRWA, in response to an Israeli allegation that 12 employees, now four, alleged, of the 13,000 people whom the agency employs in Gaza were involved in the October 7 attack. UNRWA is the body largely responsible for distributing aid ordered by the International Court of Justice in its judgment declaring that what Israel has done thus far is plausibly genocidal. Israel's prolonged campaign to close down UNRWA is fundamentally driven by the core issue embedded in UNRWA's mandate, the implementation of UN General Assembly Resolution 194, which is the right of return. Now, since 1948, UNRWA has served as a vital support system for millions of Palestinian refugees residing across the occupied territory and its other areas of operation, namely Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. And we have with us a few guests who will uh, shed some light on the significance of this move to defund UNRWA and its impact. With us, we have our own advocacy director, Aya Ziada. She's uh, AMP's advocacy director and a Palestinian American human rights scholar, activist, and writer who maintains a track record in organizing awareness of Palestine and other crucial human rights issues. And we also have with us Dr. Thad Ahmed. He's a board certified emergency medicine physician at Advocate Christ Medical Center. He's also an assistant clinical professor at the University of Illinois and a board member of Med Global, which is a medical humanitarian NGO that works in Gaza. Thank you both for being here. And let's get right to it. Aya, I do wanna start with you. I want you to uh, make sense of this U.S. position. So what do you make of it pre-October 7th um, policy, post-October 7th, especially with this decision to suspend funding and the decision to remove this lifeline, which is UNRWA? Yeah. Um, 
So we all know that the U.S. has consistently demonstrated unwavering pro-Israel stances since the inception of the apartheid state. Um, so it kind of comes to us as no sur surprise, irrespective of the administration in power, no matter the party, the rhetoric has always been by U.S. officials uh, emphasizing Israel as a vital quote-unquote friend and ally that must be safeguarded and supported at any cost. Um, and so this steadfast support manifests in the form of unparalleled, unconditional military aid um, and a privilege extended to no other nation accompanied by a deliberate refusal to enforce not only international humanitarian law, but also our own domestic laws upon Israel. Um, and so this recent de decision to suspend UNRWA aid, um, which has triggered numerous Euro European nations to also follow on the same day that the International Court of Justice called for an immediate uh, increase of humanitarian aid to Gaza was an absolutely reckless and calculated move on the U.S.'s part. Um, and even more so when considering the lack of credible evidence linking UNRWA employees to the October 7th attacks, a fact that has been acknowledged by our own government um, after the announcement that the suspension of UNRWA aid uh, would be made. Um, the suspension not only embodies or emboldens Israel to perpetrate further crimes against humanity in Gaza and Palestine, but also implicates the U.S. as an accomplice in the ongoing genocide. Um, the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza, like you mentioned, um, is exacerbated by Israel's relentless blockade of essential resources um, since the very beginning of this. From the very beginning, you had Israeli officials announcing um, a violation of international and humanitarian law of blockading water and food, which are essential resources, and by human, international human rights law, the occupier of Palestine is supposed to be providing these things. Um, and then just last night, another flower massacre was committed by Israel in which Palestinians waiting for aid were murdered. And this morning, Israel shot and killed people who were attempting to reach the dead bodies of their family members. So by suspending, suspending UNRWA aid and now trying to pursue a complete cutoff the U.S. is obviously blatantly disregarding the ICJ's rulings and failing miserably in its duty to uphold basic humanitarian principles. So, everyone, Francesca Al Albanese was appointed the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories, occupied since 1967 by the Human Rights Council at its 49th session in March of 2022 and has taken up her function as of May 2022. There's a lot more to her resume, but I'll leave it there. Um, Francesca, I do want to, and I, I provided a little bit of this in terms of just uh, the purpose of UNRWA, but I, but I want to get your perspective in terms of its origins and purpose, especially its mandate, and how impactful is the decision by the U.S. to defund it, please. Hello, everyone, and Ramadan Karim with thousand apologies for being late. I'm becoming the typical Italian who always shows up when the when the party started, no, seriously, um, it's an it's an incredibly difficult and 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 busy time, including because of what's happening to Andra, the tragedy within the tragedy. Andra is a is a very interesting agency, and I've worked for for it for three years, and then as I left the organization, I continued researching because there are so many things that look completely incomprehensible especially its mandate what, what is it there for someone calls it a humanitarian organization another one it says that it's others say that it's linked to the to the right to return and for for the palestinians and the one with andrua represent as jalal al um nicely put it it's a like a, a difficult but lasting marriage in the sense that in as much as Palestinian refugees have many criticisms to as have always criticism toward the agency, at the same time they are always uh, the most vocal in defending it, and for a number of reasons. And what was created um, is not the it was not supposed to be the main body for Palestinian refugees. And in fact, we cannot understand ANWA if we don't understand the body which was created before it and that ANWA was supposed to support. 
because the resolution 194, which is often interpreted as or indicated as the resolution that um, establishes, uh, affirms the right of return of Palestinian refugees, in fact, does so many things. It's a, it's a roadmap toward peace. This is what resolution 194 is. And it's only at paragraph 11 that it refers to refugees. Now, the, the, before doing that, Resolution 194 establishes the body which was supposed to solve the conflict that had erupted in 1948 as Israel was uh, furthering the first displacement of the Palestinians out of what it had become Israel of historical Palestine. And, uh, and that conflict that was the first Israel-Arab conflict was to be resolved by this uh, United Nations Conciliation Commission for Palestine, among whose competences was also that of securing the, re the return of the refugees who wanted to return to their homes or the settlement of those who didn't want to return. So Resolution 194, in fact, off offers the plethora of um, uh, all durable solutions to, Palest to, to Palestinian refugees. And this is the first, the first resolution that does so. Um, it's a landmark resolution. ANWA was created to rationalize the system which was there um, in 1949, so one year after the establishment of UNCCP, which was soon clear that was facing an impasse, which was which soon faced Israel's firm rejection to take on board the refugees um, and to accommodate, to settle otherwise the, what had been the conflict, the first Arab-Israeli conflict. So, because meanwhile an, a number of organizations had germinated dealing with uh, re uh, registering Palestinian Palestine refugees and providing aid to them because they were destituted, most of them had left, especially those who were displaced as of May 1948, because those who fled or were and were prevented from returning between November 1947 in March 1948, where probably were fear and, and fled out of fear, while the others were ethnically cleansed. I mean, many of them, like from Lida and, um, and Ramle, they were put in trucks and sent to the West Bank or to Jordan. So many refugees didn't have anything to live uh, uh, on, and therefore they were what we would call today civil society organizations provide, providing. Uh, for them. Um, UNRWA was created to, in a way to support UNCCP in its mandate to pursue, among others, durable solutions for Palestinian, Palestine refugees, and on the other hand, to provide, um, to provide humanitarian assistance. But bear in mind, and this is what my colleague Lex Zuckerberg wrote in his first book, that then became also my book about Palestinian refugees, there was an original scene with, with, uh, in UNRWA's mandate, that it was already clear one year after the, 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 the exodus, the Nakba, that Israel wouldn't accept the refugees. And so the emphasis was on uh, helping refugees to find job opportunities toward the resettlement. This is something that Arab countries strenuously oppose, and this is why the right of return is still managed is still mentioned, is mentioned in, UNRWA, in UNRWA's mandate. So UNRWA's mandate is linked to uh, the right of return somewhat, or to the return of Palestine, Palestinian refugees. The mandate is, was, I mean, first and foremost created, but the agency doesn't have a stated in 1949, and then the agency started with resolution 302, and then the agency started operating as of January 1950. But then it has evolved over time because with the uh, lack of resolution of the question of Palestinian refugees, with the worsening of their humanitarian situation as of the 60s, because then there was the war in, uh, in Lebanon, uh, there, the, of course the war in the occupation of the 
of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. And then wars have continued in the region, not only where UNRWA operates, but elsewhere. So UNRWA's, UNRWA's mandate has expanded to a point that today is an agency uh, mandated to, to deal with human development in fact of the Palestinians, providing jobs, education, um, hospitals. And this is also a testament for the Palestinian, for Palestinian refugees, this is so important because it's the, the symbol of the unresolved situation they are part of and the UN responsibility toward them, because it's true. The UN has a permanent responsibility toward Palestinian uh, refugees. When I say Palestinian refugees, let me just do a, a brief uh, clarification. I refer to both those who were displaced, forcibly displaced in 1947-1949, who are mostly registered with UNRWA, but also 19, those displaced from the occupied Palestinian territory in 1967. They are refugees. So this is why I refer to all of them as Palestinian refugees. And um, and uh, so one one more thing is that UNRWA's registration is not proof of the right of return. It's just proof of entitlement to receive UNRWA services. The proof that the Palestinians are uh, refugees, um, and it's not necessarily just a question of legal status, because there are Palestinians who have acquired citizenship, but in another country, but still they were the victims or the descendants of direct victims of the injustice that befell them in 1947-49 or in 1967. Therefore, they're still entitled either to return and, or not either, to return and to get compensation for what they suffered under international law as it stood at that time, 19, since 1947, and as it has also, um, uh, strengthened. So I would like to start with it also because I don't want to monopolize the discussion and I'm happy to have uh, some interaction. Always an honor listening to you. Thank you for laying that uh, laying that groundwork. And I did have follow-up for you and uh, and Aya, but I'll, uh, and uh, this is going to be more on the federal mandate itself and the Biden administration, but I want to get to Dr. Thad Ahmed. And Look, uh, I know that you have been on the ground. I want to know your experience on the ground. Can you speak to the humanitarian crisis there in Gaza? And considering that one of UNRWA's main duties is healthcare, how will defunding UNRWA impact Palestinian refugees in Gaza, which make up approximately um, just a little over 70% of the population? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. but. I think uh, every single NGO on the ground understands one reality, that the defunding of UNRWA is going to be catastrophic and it's going to have implications for an already horrible humanitarian situation. The worst humanitarian crisis that we've seen since World War II. Um, you know, it's important to realize we all know that Gaza has been under blockade for oh, you know, 16, 17 years. And that created an already precarious situation on the ground with respect to the humanitarian situation, right? We know that prior to October 7th, Gaza was not this, uh, this place that didn't have its own challenges and difficulties. And we knew that a lot of UNRWA's work was working around education and shelter and water and sanitation and health. And they really kind of embodied what all of the NGOs on the ground were doing, all of the different NGOs that are trying to do something. UNRWA had its hand in there. And so I think it's important to realize, and you mentioned a couple of these things about what's happening right now and why this idea of defunding UNRWA is truly sadistic in nature. Um, we know that there have been well over 30,000 people who have been killed in the Gaza Strip since October 7th. It's an astronomical number. It's something we're not really able to comprehend well. And we know that that number is actually probably much higher if you consider all of the people who are trapped beneath the rubble. We know that over 74,000 people have been injured. We know those details. But I think it's important to recognize a couple of things. Every single day, the Gaza Strip is dependent on over 500 humanitarian trucks to get in, to be able to sustain life. That's kind of what the situation is, right? Food, water, tents, anything, whatever it is, these are all things that you expect to be coming into the Gaza Strip. Prior to October 7th, you have over 500 of these trucks that are showing up. October 7th through October 22nd, we had zero trucks show up into the Gaza Strip. All of this is in the backdrop of airstrikes, tank shelling, a looming ground invasion, all of that has taken place. Since then, 
that number has never topped, has never gotten close to 200 trucks a day. And if you talk to any of the NGOs on the ground, all of them are saying in this wartime with the devastation that you alluded to earlier on with civilian infrastructure damaged, the waste removal plant destroyed, uh, water water uh, facilities, the desalination facility, as well as the pipes that are coming in from Israel, all of that is devastated. We should be at a thousand trucks per day. So already the amount of aid that's getting in is not nearly enough. And every, not, there's not been a single day where we've had pre-October 7th levels. What has that resulted in on the ground? And we know what's happening over this past week. There are, there are about 30 people who have died from acute malnutrition and severe dehydration. They starve to death. I mean, that's what we're talking about in the North right now with the lack of aid that's entering. Also, we know that there are over 1.9 million people who have been displaced. 1.9 million people have been displaced from their homes in the Gaza Strip. Where did they go? Where did the 1.9 million people go? They kept getting pushed further south and south and south. We also are aware that with respect to the health infrastructure, we're actually today, the number is 12 partially functioning hospitals. And when I was there in January, I was at Nasser Hospital. At the time, Nasser Hospital was the largest remaining hospital. It was the uh, main trauma center, and it was one of two referral hospitals in Gaza, the other one being in Rafah and Nasser Hospital being in Khan Yunus. Uh, of course, the biggest hospital is Shifa, and we all know the fate of Shifa in November as it was raided and rendered defunct. While I was at Nasser Hospital, we had 1,000 inpatients. This is a facility that normally can only deal with 350 people. And we also had 10,000 people sheltering in and around the hospital. Um, what we saw over the course of the uh, several weeks that we were there was also an assault on the healthcare infrastructure. The last few days that I was at Nasser, Israeli tanks began to surround the hospital. Ultimately, I was evacuated. And in the subsequent week and a half, the hospital was raided. 70 healthcare workers were abducted uh, and arrested, uh, as well as many people who ended up dying, including six ICU patients who, when the electricity was cut, suffocated to death because they were dependent on the ventilators that were there. What about education? We know that over 650,000 children have not been in school since October 7th. 650,000 children have essentially had their train, uh, had their education interrupted, but it doesn't stop there. Nobody's been going to university. No, but no medical students have been able to finish. No residents are able to finish their training. An entire generation of people have had their education disrupted. So we talked about health. We talked about the humanitarian aid. We talked about uh, education. And what about water? We know that there's uh, essentially that water has become a major crisis in the Gaza Strip. 17% of the ground water wells are functioning right now because of damage and destruction. We know that the three water plants that exist in the Gaza Strip, only two are partially functioning. And the one that's in the north, where we heard about most of these deaths from starvation and malnutrition, is totally not functioning. Waste has been piling up in the Gaza Strip because there's no waste removal services. So we see an outbreak of hepatitis A, uh, common respiratory infections. And where are these children supposed to go? These hospitals are all overwhelmed and crowded. And so every single aspect of life in the Gaza Strip has been interrupted, has been damaged, has been destroyed by the war since October 7th. But I want to mention sort of how what Anurwa's role has been in the entire war, because it truly has been only this sort of this sort of glimmer of hope uh, with respect to the NGO community. October 7th, October 22nd, uh, the organization that I uh, go to Gaza with, Med Global, there was a plan to go on October 22nd for just one of our regular projects. After October 7th happened, every single NGO was shut out of the Gaza Strip. If you weren't on the ground already, you were not going to get in. And we had been waiting and waiting and hoping to be able to get in, applying to get in. And it wasn't until the end of December, the end of December, that people heard that there was a chance for medical delegations to enter into the Gaza Strip. Not mental health providers, not humanitarian workers, but just foreign medical delegations under the World Health Organization. And so I was a part of the second foreign medical delegation to enter in January. All of this time, all of the services that people are dependent on just to live Who's been taking care of that? Who has been the main source that we know? It's really been only a few UN agencies, Anura being the biggest and the primary one. We have to keep in mind, in all of the Gaza Strip, Anura operates 165 shelters. 
165 shelters that took in out of the 1.9 million people who were displaced, 1.7 of them were staying in Anurwa shelters. And we are talking about shelters now that are at least three to four times over capacity. So you go to any Anurwa shelter in the Gaza Strip and you'll see tons and tons of people there. It was a main site and hub where aid distribution would take place. Everybody knows, okay, did aid enter from Egypt from Rafah today? Well, go to the Anurwa Center and see if, there, if there's going to be a distribution. See if you can get a loaf of bread. See if you can get a can of beans. Um, the other thing is it still was operating what we would call um, uh, medical points or health access points. Anurwa already had the infrastructure in place. They have 22 of them in the Gaza Strip. Just like the hospital system has been sort of uh, devastated, so have their medical points. But they were still operating seven out of the 22 of these. I mean, I think it's important to just kind of uh, put it into perspective. But there have been over 300,000 people that have used these medical points, used these health access points since October 7th. We know that they have their own healthcare staff, that they've done over 20,000 medical consultations and working on getting people evacuated out of the Gaza Strip. Keep in mind that, you know, services are so devastated. If you're injured or you need some sort of care or you need a doctor to take a look at you and it's not available in the Gaza Strip, you've got to leave the Gaza Strip. There are 8,000 people on a list right now who are medical evacuees who need to leave the Gaza Strip. And part of that process of trying to figure out who needs to go, who needs to come, of course, Anuro was taking care of that. I also want to mention they are one of the few organizations on the ground right now because of the lack of access who are able to provide psychosocial support and services. I mean, they've done you know over a thousand uh, interventions where they've tried to support people, psychological first aid, things that are important like that. Um, food security, of course, we know that they have benefited uh, around 400,000 families uh, distributing flour. We know that they have essentially been the one of the main organizations that have been able to provide a situation assessments. So in addition to OCHA, the Humanitarian Affairs Office from the United Nations, ANUR was publishing these reports that are available to the NGO community, uh, telling them what's taken place and what's happened. And that's been extremely helpful in trying to figure out how to make sense of what's happening on the ground and what are the areas that you need to address. And I say that it's really important, uh, the fact that they're publishing these reports, because don't forget telecommunications in the Gaza Strip has been severely disrupted. While I was there, we went through eight straight days with no signal, no telecommunications. I could not talk to the team that I was with there. I could not talk to the WHO. We could not talk to other specialists. There was no communication back and forth. When you have a network like Anurwa, where you have 165 shelters, you have 13,000 employees in Gaza, you're on top of the aid distribution. You know how many beneficiaries you've reached. It's very helpful to the rest of the NGO community to be able to understand, okay, this is where our weak points are, this is where the gaps are, and this is how we can make up for that. Um, again, they also do uh, water and sanitation services, all of the likes. So I want to just conclude by saying, when we're talking about this organization that's on the ground, the risk of defunding, I want it to be very clear. There are no NGOs that can take the place of Anura right now. It's not even serious to start beginning that, beginning that conversation. Nobody can do what they do, especially in the Gaza Strip, even if all of the NGOs combined and tried, decided that we wanted to make up for it. Oxfam, Save the Children, whoever it is, not all, none of them can do what Anura does in this moment. And defunding them during a normal time period without bombs dropping or tanks shelling, that would be one concern. Uh, but we're doing it in the midst of a very intense war with a massive humanitarian crisis. And so uh, it's very concerning. I think that I'm glad to hear that Australia, for example, resumed funding. I know that uh, many different countries have resumed funding. But of course, the elephant in the room is the United States. We've provided the largest amount of funding for ANURWA, and that needs to continue. And it's really disheartening to hear um, senators like Lindsey Graham uh, say that it's off the table. We're not going to fund them. There's no chance. And so... Um, you know, it's, it's something that everybody's paying attention to. Everybody's very concerned about in the NGO community. And I mean, it's, it's I mean, when you have a looming famine and you have a, a threat of an assault on Rafah, I mean, this is, it, it's really, you know, it's surreal to be talk, having this conversation. And that's where the majority of the population is right now in Rafah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Thad, for highlighting the gravity of the situation on the ground and the impact of what the defunding of UNRWA would, uh, would actually look like. And actually, I want to tie that into a question that I had for um, Francesca. And you, you, uh, you talked briefly about the UNCCP. 
which was created by General Assembly Res Resolution 194 to facilitate the repatriation or resettlement. Um, one of the main goals was to also search for durable solutions to the refugees' plight. Well, since that institution is defunct, I mean, it does it, it does publish an annual one-page report, I believe it still does that, where it says it has nothing new to report. But it's essentially, for all intents and purposes, defunct. So when in quote-unquote normal times, pre-October 7th period, UNRWA, with its full-scale funding that it receives, Palestinian refugees still lack, do they, do they still lack that protection yeah. mechanism. I mean, without without UNCCP, you, you only have the assistance side of things, which is UNRWA. What about the, the protection side? No, look, the, again, this is one of the, of, of the areas that I've studied, studied the most in my life. And I try to approach Palestinian refugees beyond the fragmentation that is often imposed by the countries where they are or the territories where they are and the and the fact that they experience different status and they enjoy different status and experience different treatment according to where they are and also the political relationship between the host countries and the let's say and the Palestinian authority or authorities or affiliation tribal links it's extremely complicated so one thing is for sure it's the the palestinians are the most prominent protracted refugee situation worldwide and this is because not of not lack of uh, um, legal means legal avenues but because of a political decision because um, israel there is no way that uh, israel can be can be pressured to allow the refugees to return to return because there are refugees who, who want to return, other refugees who do not want to return and live in what is today Israel, but at the same time, they don't want to forfeit their, their right, and un understandably so. Uh, also, they want an acknowledgement of what has happened to them. I think I often mention the fact, Tarek, that unlike the Jewish people whose tragedy, the, the horror they have they are suffered, it's something that is realized. I mean, even those who deny the Holocaust are are generally punished or stigmatized. So the Jewish people could come to a close with their suffering. The Palestinians, not only they kept on enduring that, and uh, they, I mean, 75 years later, I'm shocked to see, as a non-Palestinian, I'm shocked to see that there are people who still don't know, still don't understand what the Nakba is. Well, the Nakba should be as someone told me at Harvard, a Palestinian researcher said, the Nakba should criminalize, should be criminalized as, as such. So today, the, what the Palestinian refugees experience is, uh, is uh, yeah, the, 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 the legacy of this, uh, of the, of this fate of, uh, like, uh, are, are you, I mean, like the forgotten of history, and it shouldn't be so. And, and this is why I, I mean, I was so invested in this research on Palestinian refugees. Now they are prevented from having, uh, from accessing durable solutions, because even in countries like in Lebanon, where they actually want to, they they actually there are refugees who want to be resettled, want to become citizens of another country, of a Western country. They cannot do that. They cannot do that because there is this issue that. They cannot go anywhere unless, uh, uh, otherwise they would lose the right of return. This is not true. This is one of the most, I mean, most far away things I've ever heard from international law. Because they don't lose the status of refugees, or not the status of refugees, the entitlement to return, the right to return, and the right to be compensated for what they suffered. But at the same time, that right will not get any closer if they keep on being a... A, a, a deprived uh, and subjugated population in Egypt or in Lebanon or in other parts of the world. This is why I've always advocated for full realization and emancipation of Palestinian refugees. Meanwhile, the question of like, the question of um, of protection. There is no question that UNRWA must deliver protection to Palestinian refugees. It has also there has been a lot of uh, um, let's say, internal thinking in UNRWA, uh, realizing that 
UNRWA and the protection mandate because of taking care of the rights of refugees, including social economic and social and economic rights. And at the same time, this is very much, uh, I mean, this is one of those functions that encounters the highest hostility, including among those countries, uh, Arab countries, because UNRWA defending Palestinians because they've been arbitrarily arrested, Palestinian refugees because they've been arbitrarily arrested and detained or discriminated against because they are Palestinians. This is something that is very difficult to see accepted in Arab countries. And then, of course, there is the issue of protection in uh, in Israel controls area, Israel controlled areas of the occupied Palestinian territory, which is not 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 less light as you can as you can see. So it's very difficult for Arwa to to deliver to deliver anything beyond humanitarians. And for me, this is a huge and critical limitation. Um, before I go to Aya, just a quick follow up on that. So, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, can't UNRWA, doesn't UNRWA have the right to reinterpret its own mandate based on how the UN provided the mandate? So all UNRWA would need to do is just reinterpret its mandate to um, include within it a protection mechanism. Can they? Can UNRWA do that? Or does it need the General Assembly to provide that for them, to change the mandate for them? Uh, yes, uh, the let's say it's um, the General Assembly the General Assembly approves uh, um, UNRWA's, um, the, the resolution that every, every year or every two years UNRWA submits, uh, in which it describes its activities and so retroactively, tacitly approves its ex probably expanded interpretation of the mandate. But looking at the founding resolutions, I mean, the resolutions of the General Assembly and the Security Council, which have themselves expanded UNRWA's function, because, for example, the protection function of the agency come from a resolution that was passed in 1982, where UNRWA was recognized as delivering, was as having to deliver protection for the effect, for the people affected by the conflict, the Palestinians affected by the conflict. Um, and so there was another resolution in the in the late uh, in the late 80s uh, regarding during the, the first intifada regarding protection. So the mandate has been expanded over time in response to the changing needs of Palestinian refugees, in response to the uh, continuous uh, enduring lack of resolve uh, of the the root causes uh, of their, let's say, of their exile, and uh, yes, also UNRWA's interpretation. So technically, I've always advised UNRWA to issue a note on the mandate and have it approved by the General Assembly, as, OH, uh, as UNHCR has done itself. Mind you, let me give you just this example. Uh, UNHCR is the agency that deals with refugees, so people who have been forcibly displaced across a border, so they are outside of their country. Nonetheless, UNHCR also deals with IDPs, internally displaced people. Uh, and why so? Because it has, uh, it, it has filled a humanitarian vacuum with its services. And then this has been sort of regularized, recognized by the General Assembly. UNRWA should fill the humanitarian vacuum that is there in so many areas for Palestinian refugees and deliver what these people need to, to have instead of, you know, hiding itself uh, behind a finger saying, no, but this is not in my mandate, which at times UNRWA does. Thank you for that, Francesca. Um, yeah, I want to shift the gears just a little bit. I want to come back to the Biden administration. Aya. Yeah. So how how hypocritical is it? I think that would that would be the right the the right word that the Biden administration reacts to Israeli quote unquote allegations by instantly requesting to cut off funding to UNRWA, but does absolutely nothing when the International Court of Justice orders Israel to abide by the Genocide Convention in its rendering of provisional measures. Yeah, it's literally absurd. I mean, it verifies a couple of things. It verifies that the West 
has always been and and will clearly always be until something major shifts incredibly islamophobic anti-palestinian um and frankly only values the the lives of like people that look like them um we often compare it to ukraine and russia where if we want to compare palestine to ukraine which unfortunately yes ukraine deserves humanitarian aid but they're still incomparable in that Palestine has been occupied for the last 75 years. What Palestinians have been subjected to has been decades long, not merely a couple of years. Meanwhile, Ukraine has been uh, funded with military aid, supported in this way. And then Russia has been compared to Palestinians. Um, so it's been absolutely absurd. It also reamps how the United States tends to pledge allegiance to a foreign government, which is the apartheid state as opposed to our own government, our own people, and representing our own people. And we all know that for decades, Israel has been supplied with ample weaponry by, by us, um, guaranteed to have committed war crimes against Palestinians with them, with the, the military aid and weaponry that we supply them. And yet the U.S. has a difficult time tracking whether or not the weapons we're supplying with, with are being used in their um, in these atrocities, such as the murder of Shirin Abu Akhla. Um, and we've continued to go against our own U.S. laws, dismissing Israel of any accountability. And I would even go as far as to say covering for them. And we have laws like the Leahy laws um, that were created to be a cornerstone, a cornerstone of our commitment to human rights and intended to prevent U.S. military assistance from being used by foreign military un uh, units implicated in gross human rights violations, such as Israel. Um, and yet we violate them for the sake of Israel being our quote unquote close ally and friend. Um, and even now, Congress is attempting to change processes to please the apartheid state. This week alone, Representative Jim McGovern has been pushing a discharge petition to force a vote on H.R. 5673, which is a Senate passed foreign aid package that would provide $95 billion for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. And while he states that he doesn't want to fund the Israeli government right now, as it continues its unjust war on Gaza, he and other members of Congress are being hypocritical and trying to change the usual appropriations process to arbitrarily give nearly $100 billion in foreign aid to these countries before they even fulfill their constitutional obligations to fully fund our own government here. Again, we're talking about over 31,000 Palestinians Palestinian lives lost um, in just five months compared to the death toll in Ukraine of two years, which is significantly less than that. Um, and Israel's grave crimes against humanity demand immediate action. We won't stop radiating the fact that the only um, solution to this is number one, a lasting ceasefire uh, demanded by and facilitated by the Biden administration and the U.S. government urgent influx of abundant humanitarian aid, unconditional release of political prisoners, and a bold stance by the United States to enforce its own laws by immediately halting um, all military aid to Israel. And anything short of these measures is an affront to humanity and a betrayal of justice. And that's the unfortunate road that the United States, and more specifically the Biden administration and the current Congress, are seemingly going down. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite it's quite unfortunate what we're witnessing uh, now. And and uh, President Biden did call in his uh, State of the Union address for um, a temporary port or pier um, to to facilitate the uh, transport of aid. And Dr. Thad, I want to put this question uh, to you. So, what do you make of that, given the context of the potential defunding of of UNRWA? You're on mute. Sorry. I would say there's there's a couple of things I'd want to mention about that. It's interesting to see that the United States is not pushing to have all border crossings open, Erez, Karam Shalom, and Rafah fully open. I mean, that would be the easier thing than to build a temporary port, right? It's just allow these ports to enter. We can do trucks and trucks of aid entering. It's bizarre that we decided to go for airdrops at first, which everybody knows is an incredibly inefficient, expensive, and potentially dangerous way, as we saw five Palestinians killed in an airdrop 
last weekend um, because the parachute didn't deploy. So we know that somehow they're trying to deliver humanitarian aid. They're not trying to go through the most efficient channels. So we hear about a port in place. Biden said he doesn't want troops on the ground, which means you need an implementing partner. So you're going to bring a ship and a port and you need to deliver this aid. Who can deliver the aid? How are the Palestinians supposed to get it? He said that this is going to be no boots on the ground. The security is going to be controlled by Israel. I don't know what that means, but I, do, I am very concerned because we watched what happened when five convoys with flour got into the northern Gaza Strip surrounded by Israeli tanks. We saw a massacre take place. Over 100 Palestinians killed in that moment. And we see that every single time Palestinians have tried to uh, accept aid or get aid, somehow they end up in body bags. And that's very concerning if you're starting to say that the Israelis are going to handle the logistics, which I hope that that's not true. Um, and then the other part of this, too, is part of what delays so many of this of, of this process is these inspections. They're very tedious. They're redundant. And oftentimes what trucks will have with aid in it, they'll be sent back and they'll have to queue. This, these trucks have, you know, infant formula on them. They have, uh, you know, uh, diabetes pens, insulin needles. So if this port is going to be there, is it going to accelerate that process? And what we're hearing from the Biden administration is probably not. Probably in Cyprus. Israel is going to continue to do the inspections. And so if we're in, if this is just a symbolic situation, I mean, I think that's really a cruel way to suggest that, oh, we're going to increase aid. But in fact, the situation on the ground is not going to change very much. And, and the other thing that I think is important to find out is he announced this in the State of the Union address on Tuesday. This port would take 60 days to construct, let alone, you know, how are you going to figure out all of the logistics on the ground? So I'm very concerned to hear about it. Anurwa is everyone knows that Anurwa is probably the only agency, the only organization that could be able to distribute the aid in an efficient manner, especially to all of the shelters that we talked about and to different parts of the Gaza Strip. And I'm just uh, I'm concerned that it's become so political that a lot of people are going to suffer as a result of this. Yeah, actually, following up on Dr. Thatter's point, the Biden administration is pretty much doing everything but ending the war on Gaza. Um, they're trying to take different hoops um, and measures to kind of show that they're doing something about it, especially in the context of elections coming around. You know, like the Palestinian Arab communities, Muslim communities have shown that they are not going to reelect him because of how he's played as an accomplice to the genocide. Um, and multiple people have said this before, but President Biden is the only human on this earth that can call the Israeli government and completely cut military aid and force Israel's hand at stopping the war on Gaza completely and allowing for humanitarian aid to enter efficiently, not just by building a port. Um, and he refuses to do so. I mean, he didn't even call for a ceasefire until recently and even then he called for a temporary ceasefire only for the release of hostages that is not a ceasefire that's a pause to release hostages and then give israel the green light to continue its brutal genocide on gaza um so all of this lies in the u.s government's hands look um first first of all i want to thank you all for being here and uh, participating in this and for taking for taking the time we all know what is happening on the ground um i just did want to leave with a final note um you know we we send our prayers to the families in gaza we know that um they've suffered a lot over the last five plus months and of course longer the longer than that but it's definitely intensified to levels unimaginable so we need to keep the conversation going and we do what we can here um, where we reside. And uh, before we end this, um, I did want to make a quick announcement. We invite you to make this blessed month of Ramadan a turning point in the work for Palestine in America. We cannot continue at the same pace. We see profound changes in American public opinion toward Palestinian rights and potential political repercussions for U.S. leaders who support the genocide in Gaza. This is the time to invest more in our awareness campaigns, mobilization, and advocacy work to ensure positive, sustainable, and impactful transformations. Please be sure to make a contribution today. And once again, I thank you all again. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.